fire up your planet crackers and load up your line cutters because it's time for another cataclysmic limb shredding marker filled episode of what happened the show where we pledge our undying souls to the divine teachings of unitology if you take a panicked sweaty glance over at your calendar you might notice it's still october so dead space ah the kickoff to the man everyone hates us let's actually develop some cool games initiative that ea implemented in the mid to late 2000s one of the key studios who was at the center of this movement was redwood shores responsible for a number of well-loved 007 and lord of the rings titles like those that you see here eventually the team wanted to tackle something a bit darker that was out of their wheelhouse which at the time was the aforementioned movie licenses so they got to work on system shock 3. <coughs> no, I didn't stutter. Dead Space's initial pitch was simply horror in space, and early talks were being had to make it a new entry into the lighthearted series about a mischievous AI who causes trouble. Packer. System Shock was developed by Looking Glass and distributed by Origin, a publisher whose parent company just happened to be Electronic Arts. Now while some may snidely chuckle at the very idea of this, when you break it down, both franchises share some DNA. A silent protagonist stranded in an isolated space space-based location that's gone to hell, a hideous menagerie of mutated horrors to contend with, and flipping a lot of switches. Redwood Shores were prototyping a slow-paced descent into madness, methodical but with some spurts of action, and really felt that they could do System Shock justice. But then, this happened. <laughs> Thus, the team cleared their drawing board and started over again. Ben Wannett, a then production designer on Dead Space, recalled, It was like, everybody, get out System Shock 2, play it from start to finish, and let's figure out what we're going to do. Then, Resident Evil 4 came out, and we were like, oh, oh, no, this is the shit. Knowing, however, that this new action focus would rub fans of System Shock the wrong way, as well as the complicated ownership of the franchise itself, something that was in a legal limbo for for years, the team decided it was best to turn it into a brand new IP, which, as you can imagine, is a hard sell at Electronic Arts. It was at a time at EA when there was no appetite for original IP. It seemed like everybody was making a sequel, except for us. Once people saw that it was a real thing, they understood it much easier than if you were to go, oh, I want to make this totally scary ass thing, to which they'd look at their portfolio and say, Nope, scary ass thing is not in our language. With the smash success of Resident Evil 4, coupled with the building hype for RE5, Electronic Arts decided to throw their marketing muscle at Dead Space, and upon its positive critical reception, rebranded Redwood Shores as Visceral Games, giving them a bit more autonomy in creating riskier projects. However, there was one aspect of Dead Space that was left on the cutting room floor, a back of the box feature that would go on to be in a sticking point between developer and publisher from then on out. This feature was full two-player co-op and was something Visceral experimented with and even got it working pretty well in later builds of the original Dead Space. Unfortunately, this technical breakthrough came far too late into the project, as most of the mechanics and level design had already been finalized, which of course didn't mesh very well with two players. Most areas were too cramped for two thick-ass Isaacs to even move around in, as everything had been designed with single player in mind. Ammo drops, weapons, weapons, enemy HP, there was just too much that would need to be rejiggered for co-op to even work, so while they learned a great deal from these tests, the idea was promptly scrapped. Dead Space went on to sell roughly 2 million copies in its lifetime, a good start to any franchise, but far behind what EA deemed to be a rollicking success. Therefore, for 2011's sequel, Dead Space 2, a tonal shift occurred to appeal to the fans of the blockbuster action of the current Resident Evil games. Isaac, who kept his mouth firmly shut in the first game, was now like an actual man guy. Jesus, Dross. You okay? There were huge bombastic set pieces that would make even Michael Bay blush, and overall the game had a slightly faster, tighter pace, while still retaining lots of creepy moments and a sense of impending dread. Along with this though, there was pressure from marketing to implement some type of online functionality, because in 2011, if your game didn't, 
I, I don't know, I, I guess EA would just shut you down. Making the best of an unideal situation, Visceral felt strongly against the idea of compromising the vision of the single player campaign by adding co-op and thus started working on a separate multiplayer deathmatch mode that I... I forgot even existed until this very sentence. As expected to the majority of critics and fans, Dead Space 2 multiplayer was just simply ignored, many citing that the mode just wasn't suited for the franchise. Ben Wannett agreed, I personally don't believe it added a lot of value to the product. Even though it was fun to play as a diversion, I don't think it's why people even bought it. Fortunately, people did buy Dead Space 2 two times more than the first game. All told, 4 million copies were shifted, but with the game's increased developmental budget plus marketing, this still wasn't good enough for EA. Then president of EA Labels, Frank Gibault, now CEO of Zynga if you remember them, cut a shitty promo on Dead Space 2 shortly after it launched. In general, we're thinking about how we make this a more broadly appealing franchise because ultimately you need to get to audience sizes of around 5 million to really continue to invest in an IP like Dead Space. Anything less than that and it becomes quite difficult financially given how expensive it is to make games and market them. So, despite selling more, increasing its overall review scores, and being embraced by fans and critics, what resulted from all this? Well, that would be Dead Space 3, the final space nail in the space coffin of uh, Dead Space. I don't think that's a good idea. Now, most of us know about the mistake, uh, I mean the changes. No, I mean the mistakes that DS3 made, and I'm not skipping those, don't worry, we'll get there. What I want to start with, however, is the more fascinating part of the story, what Dead Space 3 was going to be. Ben Wannott, in an interview with Eurogamer, opened up about what the original vision was for Isaac's winter getaway. While some of those aspects would be retained for the final game, a whole host of others went through what some would call EAification. Firstly, it would have been a harrowing tale of survival and desperation, and, like the retail game, would have primarily taken place on the planet of Tau Volantis, with Isaac and a group of characters exploring the frozen landscape. Eventually, each one would get picked off, either by the encroaching necromorphic horde, or, more intriguingly, an unseen assailant, which of course increased the tension and paranoia within the group. Sound familiar? You guys gotta listen to Gary! He can beat one of those things! Now, co-op wasn't even a consideration in this early concepting phase, but that would soon change. Ben Wannett, who had been promoted to creative director on Dead Space 3, stated that this original direction was going to be deeper, darker, and deadlier, which was marketing speak for the more personal, smaller, and slower-paced foundation that had been laid down by the first game. This pivot in direction was due to two main reasons. After the faster pace and bigger scope of DS2, slowing it down and narrowing the focus was be the smarter route than trying to top what they had already done. The other reason was linked to the first reason, because Electronic Arts slashed their budget, like considerably. So yeah, they didn't really even have a choice. The idea of that unseen assailant was also taking shape, with an entity known internally as Shadow Isaac being the culprit. This is basically going to be a tormentor who would berate and belittle vanilla Isaac during the game, similar to Nicole in DS2. Shadow Isaac was being reported on by several news outlets at the time, was never officially confirmed, which in the end was for the best, because the whole thing was cut of course, <gasps> but by who? While Visceral were sussing out all these details, the same thing that happened with the first two Dead Spaces occurred once again. Another box needed to be ticked to add value to the product. After the, let's be polite here, tepid reaction to the dishwater deathmatch of the last game, co-op was once again brought up as the big new feature. Now, since Visceral had conducted those early tests, they were able to build DS3 around it, especially since it was early enough in the design process. One had said creating games for EA around this time revolved around making a lot of compromises, and that you can't just say, no, we don't want to, so we're not going to put in any multiplayer or co-op. If you do this, you risk your game getting cancelled. In this same spirit of compromise, however, Visceral felt they could take the Shadow Eyes a concept and integrate it into the co-op in a novel way. Meanie Bobini Isaac would have had his face covered at all times, not too difficult considering this is Dead Space, and his identity would remain vague throughout the duration of the game. This would then result in a big 
twist reveal showing that Liquid Isaac, i.e. the second player, was a fabrication of Solid Isaac's fractured psyche. So, Fight Club, but in space! This focus on degrading mental health and dementia, however, was frowned upon by the marketing department of Electronic Arts, as it was deemed as not very marketable, so Shadow Isaac was changed to the much more marketable Sergeant Carver! Yeah, Carver. So, the last vestige of Dead Space 3 doing anything interesting or risky was Dash, with only one shred of their original idea remaining. Now, due to how the story played out in many instances, Carver would just disappear and reappear at random for absolutely no reason. This would have been explained away much better with the imaginary nature of violent Isaac, but these were the cards that Visceral were dealt. Now, that shred of their original idea, well that wound up being the concept of both players seeing cutscenes and other events play out in different ways, having them question what was really real. Ben Wannett laments their inability to flesh this out more, as they simply didn't have enough time to expand upon it. One thing they were able to expand upon, however, were the environments themselves, which, depending on who you ask, wasn't necessarily a good thing. Dead Space 1 and 2 were lauded for having very detailed, dense environments that were meticulously designed. In Dead Space 3, though, environments were constructed to be bigger, simpler, and emptier, to accommodate the space that two players would occupy, with a focus on less objects and labyrinth-like layouts to mitigate getting stuck. Now, this can be seen as a step back, because to create a sense of dread and tension, environmental details are really important, but in an action game, not so much. And by this point, Visceral were very aware that Dead Space was rapidly necromorphing into an action game. The human element was then introduced into the campaign, a gun-wielding force that were designed to drain players of their resources, as cover-based shooting usually tends to do. Even so, with two players teaming up, these clashes, further mixed with the swarms of necros, still couldn't provide a suitable challenge. Ben Wannett admits that most players needed to turn the game up to max difficulty so as not to breeze through it, as they didn't have the time to properly balance the minutia of ammo and weapons between Isaac and, um, and, uh, what's his face over there? Worst yet was the crafting system, which basically broke the game in a completely different way. In the same Eurogamer interview, Wanted again explains the original purpose of the crafting system, i.e. picking up bits of garbage and then bolt onto each other to fabricate some type of Borderlands monstrosity, was simply meant to get across Isaac's engineering background and to give fans slightly more creativity. However, it wound up providing uh, maybe too much creativity, giving birth to weapons with very few weaknesses like fast-firing, acid-tipped explosive saw blades and the like. This then led to an over-reliance on the same powerful weapons to get through most situations, and coupled with the co-op, made Dead Space 3, a survival horror game, contain very little horror and no real threat to anyone's survival. So with all that good news out of the way, microtransactions! <laughs> The idea of charging players real money to craft faster and better was an idea from EA higher-ups, and while Visceral were against it, eventually the hammer came down and it was suddenly in the game. This is one of the most common complaints fans and critics had about DS3, and while it wasn't integral to beating or enjoying the game, it was one of the earlier examples of the practice being introduced into a big console franchise, thus plenty of vitriol was thrown its way. It is what it is, and what it is was not a very good idea. I don't think that's a good idea. Now, Steve Papoutsis, a head guy at Visceral, probably tried his best to mediate between EA and his dev team, but obviously was losing a lot of these battles. Nothing, however, would lose more than the infamous early gameplay showcase of Dead Space 3 that was released by EA in the run-up to launch. This thing, I just... I, okay, this isn't exactly fair to the guy. Steve was at the head of the company, not a writer, so his promo smacks of a marketing loser thinking they know what fans wanted to hear. I, I'm not even going to explain it more than that. Roll the clip! Pay attention to what's going on here. You're going to get to see Necros getting pulped into this giant drill, which is awesome. And we really spent a lot of time making sure the pulping was super awesome because I like saying the word pulping, and it's super awesome to see bits and body parts go flying, and it's just, it's freaking cool. 
So we did it, and it's awesome. This did not help. Thus, when Dead Space 3 released with a cavalcade of new but not welcome gameplay additions, the reviews were a step down from the previous entries. This also doomed Visceral from a variety of standpoints, as their output significantly dropped after DS3 before having their big Star Wars game cancelled, along with their entire studio's cancellation in 2017. Ben Wanut has since moved on to Sledgehammer Games and is currently working on an unannounced project. He laments Visceral never got to flesh out the ideas they had for a theoretical Dead Space 4, which would have taken another direction altogether. The notion was you were trying to survive day to day against infested ships, searching for a glimmer of life, scavenging supplies to keep your own little ship going, trying to find survivors. The flotilla section in Dead Space 3 hinted at what non-linear gameplay could be, and I would have loved to have gone a lot deeper into that. Imagine an entire roster of ships ship types, each with unique purposes, floor plans, and gameplay. Our original prototypes for the Dead Space 3 flotilla had some pretty wild setups that I wish we had been able to use. This could have been the shakeup the franchise needed, and certainly would have been a better send off to what Dead Space 3 wound up being. And to EA's credit, you won't hear me say that often, they tried their damnedest to make Dead Space a thing. Comic books, animated movies, spin-off games, novels, action figures, even an attempt at a motion picture. They put serious bank behind this franchise. But listen, unless you're Resident Evil, the king of the survival horror hill, it's maybe not advisable to pour so much money into your blossoming horror franchise so early in the first place, as it's a risky venture. As long as you have a team with a sincere passion for horror, put out a game with solid mechanics and an interesting premise, well, sometimes that's all people really want. While I love Dead Space 2 as much as the next guy, it didn't need massive battles with football field sized bosses. It didn't need bombastic action set pieces and tons of characters. It just needed to be horror in space, and it needed to be budgeted appropriately. It's incredibly hard to just take any game and turn it into a AAA blockbuster immediately. Resident Evil looked like this when it first started, and it looked like that more or less until the fourth or fifth game, but EA couldn't be bothered to grow the franchise slowly over the course of like 10 years. Nah, man! No, 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 no! So Visceral is dead. The creative heads of the franchise have moved on to different companies, and EA has shown less than zero interest in reinvigorating Dead Space in any shape, way, or form. So unfortunately, stay where it is, orbiting in the cold, lonely void of space. Dead. So if you know of any other tragically tarnished tales of titanic trouble in the world of video games, movies, or etc, do a zero-g jump over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to officially cast your vote on our next subject. See you next time, fellow unitologists, and praise be to the marker.